Funding for Current Conversations is provided by the University of Oklahoma President's Office, the OU Office of Student Affairs, OU Outreach, and World Literature Today. Welcome to Current Conversations. I'm R.C. Davis Sundiano. Today, we are speaking with the winner of the 2016 prestigious Newstat International Prize for Literature. Dubrovka Ugresic is a native of the former Yugoslavia and one of the most prominent novelists and essayists writing in the world today. Join us and meet this fascinating writer. Let me start off, if you don't mind, taking you back to 1993. Um, I, I think the world has been interested in what happened to you back then because it's shaped your, your writing uh, in so many ways. What happened in 1993? Uh, in 1993, I decided to, to simply to leave Croatia, my home, and um, I didn't uh, know anything. I mean, I didn't have any plan. Um, uh, very often people ask me, why uh, did you choose Amsterdam? I was going to ask that. Yeah, yeah, for, for your new home. But, you know, uh, when you leave country in the way I left and in the age I left, mm -hmm. then you don't, you can't have any plan. I mean, refugees, they do not have plan. Right. I mean... So uh, at one point it happened that I simply, uh, I spent a year in Germany as a grantee uh, of the, the AAD grant in Berlin. Then I spent a year in uh, America, in Harvard, Boston, mm -hmm. uh, being um, a fellow of uh, Bunting Institute Fellowship. Then I got something in Amsterdam for a year, and then I thought maybe I should settle uh, for a while in, in, in that beautiful town. That was it. But the reason why I, I, I left uh, the country, I don't know how much audience or you knows, but in 1991, uh, Yugoslavia, uh, a country of six republics of two religions, three religions, two uh, letters, Cyrillic and Latin, a uh, couple of languages, uh, fell apart. Right. And the war started. And the, before the war, uh, it's, the war was pushed somehow by amazing uh, level of nationalism and hatred, ethnic hatred, in between Serbs and Croats, and then it be in between religious groups. And it was impossible for me to uh, stay there, to do anything, uh, to act, to be against, because I didn't have any space. Let, 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 me, let yeah. me jump in. I think it's so common, in a way, for writers to be at odds with uh, governments and, and to feel uh, oppressed. You must have had an inkling that this wasn't going to end, that this wasn't a temporary yeah. situation. At some level, there must have been an alarm that was being set off in you that where you said, I really have to leave altogether. I think that it was, it was a mad decision because nobody in the history of literature, by the way, mm -hmm. I didn't see uh, any bi writer's biography that anybody would leave country uh, in, uh, I mean, being 44 as I was. Mm -hmm. I mean, e especially in those countries there, I mean, when you are 44, then people usually think about retirement plan and not about Seriously. going to exile. Yeah. So, so my decision was impulsive. I couldn't breathe anymore. And I simply left. And besides, before that, I also managed to become a public enemy. So I was accused by media, by, by local media, by, uh, because what I've written 
uh, that that I'm a traitor, I'm a public enemy. Oh, this must have been terrible. Because I didn't support I didn't support this this prevailing all prevailing policy of nationalism, mm -hmm. and I would go even further, and I would say that uh, I mean the diagnosis picture of symptoms it was almost a that I would dare to say it was almost a fascism. Mm -hmm. Because if you have, and you read about that, you know about that, if you have, uh, the, I mean, the concentration camps, as they were in Bosnia, mm -hmm. uh, if you have a genocide, as it was in Bosnia, when uh, General Latko, Ratko Mladic, who is now at Hague Tribunal, when he exterminated, I mean, 10,000 Muslim people in Bosnia, Bosnians, yeah. men. Um, uh, the other thing I recall yeah. is that I think you were also a scholar, weren't you? Weren't you thinking of being a literary scholar, you at the University of Zagreb? Yes. And, uh, and uh, so you were facing this choice, weren't you? Kind of scholar, writer. Yeah. Was leaving part of making the decision to go the direction of being a writer? Yeah, but but being a scholar also doesn't, uh, I mean, protect you against uh, moral choices. That was my moral choice, mm -hmm. uh, not to be there, not to supp support all of that, and and then to act, uh, although the space was small, uh, writing about all of that in my essays what really happened. Were you nervous about being in a completely different culture that's a different language? Uh, you, you, you had grown up in a place where you understood so, you know, the millions yeah. of things one understands about yeah. one's own country. Did you worry about the uh, alienation of being, of being in exile in, a, in another culture? You know what, when when situation is um, as it was with me, then you don't think much. I, I didn't worry. I mean, I didn't know anything. I just, I just left. And then things bit by bit uh, sort of settled, although my lifestyle is still, I would say, um, um, yes, uh, I arrived to Netherlands long time ago, but... Uh, I came to Netherlands a long time ago, but I didn't arrive yet. So I'm still in, in a sort of limbo, you know. Uh, I'm not fully integrated, uh, although I like the place. Um, and I like Amsterdam, and um, everything is fine. But I also do travel. So in that respect, I would say uh, for me that I'm post-national. I lack any... Citizen you know, of, of literature. Those attachments. Citizen of literature, I think you said. It, it yeah. is, yes. Yeah. I would say this is, this is probably the, uh, was the there best ever, definition. Was there ever a moment where, where you said to yourself, I'm, I'm becoming an exile, yes. and I'm going to live outside of the culture that I've known my whole yes. life? And that's a powerful metaphor for our time. I mean, I, yeah. I think we can see that in your yes. writing. Did yeah. that ever occur to you? We're all exiles in some yeah. important way. Yeah, I think that I was um, sort of articulating literary, through literature, uh, my position uh, from different points of view mm -hmm. and from different genres and literary forms. Mm -hmm. One is essay, the other one is novel. For instance, the novel Museum of Unconditional S Surrender, Surrender and the other one uh, Ministry of Pain, they all, in fact, have that major theme of how does it feel to be to be exiled. Uh, and of course we are using now many words for for that state. Uh, exile or we would say uh, uh, I mean refugees or we would say although I was never officially refugee so I can't pretend on, on that status. But I think that media and everybody else, they, they like to dif differentiate and put everybody uh, under this totally indifferent term, like migrants, you know? Mm -hmm. So 
in media pre is prevailing the term. If you notice that, they are all like migrants. Right. Migrants uh, term migrants like hurt less. Right, right, right. Uh, like it hurts less. Right, so it a temporary is not so, state. Like a temporary state, then you you can never say whether those people came uh, just in search for job or you know it it is it is a sort of a term that releases you of any guilt or right, right. even compassion. If you hadn't, if you yeah. had not become an exile, don't writers in a, in a certain way have to find a kind of exile status even in their own culture? You can't become too involved. You're, you're watching, you're understanding, you're, you have insights into the culture that are different than the people who are caught up with daily life. Isn't that true? Yeah, but we can't transform that into a rule. I mean, writers, they choose right. all sorts of positions and perspectives. Uh, for me, uh, it appeared it is probably natural, this, uh, this perspective of an outsider. That's what I was getting of at. Of the yeah. one who does not belong. Right. That allows me a sharper view, or a special, not sharper, but a different. And um, and yes, I think that maybe I didn't, maybe I'm not even conscious of that. But maybe yeah. I'm 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 the girl who does not belong. So because uh, you were becoming any. a writer, and, and you have a vision, and you're an artist. When I, I, was... I can't, I can't, I wouldn't, you know, translate that into a guidance or anything yeah. like that. <laughs> no, no. But, but I think, when I was thinking about yeah. you, I was thinking about James Joyce, yeah. and he famously said that Ireland hurt him into becoming a writer. Yeah. That, that gave him the distance to see Ireland more Clearly, and while he didn't live a whole life in exile, I think yeah. he felt like an exile. It is, it is possible because you you take on many levels you take this this outsider's view. Even even what concerns when you mentioned uh, the James Joyce, even when it comes to language and use of language, mm -hmm. I mean it is a bit different when you are an exiled writer. I think. Did you go through a period in Amsterdam? where you wondered if you could be a writer there. And, and I'm just wondering if there was a work that for you kind of signaled, yes, this is going to work. I can be a writer in Amsterdam. Was there one work that maybe no, told you? I never questioned that because I, I went to so-called exile when I was too old and when I was already a writer. Mm -hmm. So I didn't become writer abroad. Right. I was already a writer with with a couple of books and with my um, pretty successful career uh, in former Yugoslavia. So I was not, uh, and already few books were translated into foreign languages. So um, so I was a writer. I just prolonged writing in different circumstances. Right. At this point, I count about 12 volumes that have been translated into English. Yeah. And that's just translated into English. So you have a very large corpus of work. Uh, it's just, it's really very uh, impressive. Uh, um, thank you, but I wouldn't say that. I, I always blame myself that uh, I'm not a writer from, uh, <clears throat> probably because I'm a woman, you know. <laughs> but you I know, know, but I, I I can say this, and yeah, maybe you okay. you can't. That mm -hmm. you're, when you publish a new work, it's an event. People anticipate it. Uh, it's an important yeah. event in the literary world. People anticipate your writing and value it. Uh, you're an international star as a writer. Yeah. yeah. I I uh, I don't know anything about that because I don't feel like that. You know. Yeah. <laughs> that uh, writers are always uh, they always. They're modest. I mean, they feel insecure because there is no uh, objective or, you know, scientific proof that <laughs> they are good writers or bad writers. So they always feel insecure. And I even met Nobel Prize winners who, who were extremely insecure, you know. When you, when Their you... self-esteem was very low. So, when, when you think, though, to yourself, yeah. what you've achieved at this point yeah. in a, a really yeah. wonderful writing career, 
what do you think of that you, you say, I'm glad I did this in my writing, I'm glad I did that? What, what would those points be, the points that were, were you, the, your sense of achievement? Uh, if I'm a literary critic? Sure. Sure, okay. Because that, that's fine, because I was a literary critic. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I yeah. mean, I had this, um, uh, both, both careers. So, so when I talk about myself, uh, what I try to avoid, of course, uh, then, then um, I don't have this, uh, you know, I, I read it as any other text, mm -hmm. so as a literary critic. So yes, I, what I would say, I would say that, um, first of all, it is, it is not so um, common that what I do in my, let's say, fiction writing, that all those books uh, could be read as a sort of highly literary projects. Mm -hmm. uh, they all differ from each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm also very careful about building a text, constructing a text, mm -hmm. um, about uh, composition, about the architecture of the novel, let's say. Um, so all of that is um, makes books, my books, to differ uh, from each other. You and don't repeat is, yourself at all. At least I try to. Right, right. <laughs> maybe, maybe I repeat myself a little bit in essays, but I also, uh, or let's say that there are themes I'm obsessed with, so I wouldn't mean miss to mention them. Mm -hmm. in one or another book. Uh, like, like, I'm really bothered by those political affairs, some of them uh, with systems, regimes, status of democracy, this and that. So that I will obsessively repeat. But otherwise, I'm also trying that my uh, essayistic books differ from each other. Let's say a book, Thank You for Not Reading, is uh, very compact, mm -hmm. and it is all about only publishing industry, writers, literature, uh, the, although the, the book, let's say, The Culture of Lies, is mostly about, uh, about nationalism and strategies of nationalism, uh, while uh, the book Karaoke Culture mm -hmm. has this major essay, uh, 100 pages long on karaoke culture where I'm trying to um, uh, articulate, not to define because this is impossible, uh, our time and culture of our time and this, this um, uh, historical switch from Gutenberg civilization to digital civilization and what is happening with all of us. In, in, in culture. And I was reading something by you last night and you were talking about uh, public intellectuals and the way men very often yeah. sort of dominate that space in the yeah. culture. But you really are a public intellectual at this point. You weigh in on so many important issues that I think you're very yeah. sensitive to, especially things that have to do with displacement of peoples and uh, difficulties they're facing that I think other people maybe become a little callous to, you bring us back morally to a lot of these very important issues. Yeah, I don't feel like that. But this essay you were mentioning, uh, it's, um, it's about again and again and again, it is stressing an obvious, obvious inequality in literature, and this is that male gender uh, prevails and dominates and rules too. You know, uh, uh, although things are changing each second in favor of women mm -hmm. writers and intellectuals and academics, nevertheless, we are still uh, in this shameless, I would say, gender inequality. The, the essay that I'm talking about, yeah. The Skull's Bridal, yeah. I, I was very struck by it. I've, yeah. I read this a long time ago. And yeah. then, uh, 
it's very powerful. And it seems to me there's an unwillingness to be anything but direct and honest. And yeah. here's the situation with women right now, yeah. not just in writing, but in the professional yeah. world where, where power is politically yeah. and culturally. Could you talk about that a little bit? You have a perspective that I think a yeah. lot of people don't have because you yeah. are a citizen of literature and you travel yeah. around the world. I was careful to mention just um, uh, areas which I know the best, and this is Croatia, uh, Eastern Europe, uh, uh, not to offend or upset some other literary zones, you know. Um, um, so, so it is, I like very much, in fact, because there, there has been, through all those years, a lot of talking about that, gender inequality in culture. But um, people forget and they go back to the routine, you mm -hmm. know. So I like very much, um, there is an American uh, group of women, they call themselves Vida. They just go and count with calculator. They just, such and such, you know, prizes, uh, reviews, uh, uh, percentage of books published by men and by uh, editors, publishing houses. So, so it's very interesting to get figures, you know. Right. Then you feel more, I feel more secure when I have figures in front of me. Um, but, but it is, the, it belongs to sociology of literature, all of that. But sociology of literature is extremely important you know, mm -hmm. and uh, it shapes so many things, mm -hmm. starting from a um, point of view of even reading the text, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so you read differently the text written by, if there is a male name or a female name, mm -hmm. uh, then canon, a question of canon. Right. So uh, kids, girls and boys, they have in the school What's identified as the books they need to read? Yeah. Predominantly male canon. Right. Um, so my little niece, for instance, she is tortured uh, in, in school, in grammar school, by uh, poetry, uh, pieces of literature written almost 100% by men. And, um, and that should be, I mean, changed because... Uh, men offer so-called universalist, universalistic view on the thing. Make themselves the norm. Yeah, yeah. and then there is also um, something in the country. There is also something very interesting. It is like di dyslexia, okay? Mm -hmm. Men can't read women's texts. They simply get blind. It's <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm joking now. <laughs> I'm no, but your but, point is a powerful but, one. But it is that they can't accept it. This is like, you, you know, you become colorblind. You, you can't see. Right. Let us hope that that will change. Although, uh, in, let's say, uh, societies, those post-communist societies, uh, like Serbia, Croatia, like, you know, uh, there is in those 25 and more years after the fall of the wall, uh, everything turned back in those democrac democracies. Right. Everything turned back, uh, and it is a sort of a time machine. So suddenly church has an enormous influence. And if church penetrated into the school box, into schools, into everywhere, then of course that notion of female and male goes back to. Exactly. So like the it's, Catholic it's Church, like, for example. Yes, yeah. Catholic Church, for example, yeah, or any other. So so this is what is what is happening. That's why I'm pretty depressed. That's why I don't have in that respect much hope until you can't change a cultural sphere within rigid political sphere. I, I, I think everybody appreciates, everybody that I yeah. know who's read the essay, 
yeah. uh, the Skulls Bridal appreciates the strong statement. I mean, it's unambiguous. Yeah. You're making the case, and you're saying, yeah. I'm not willing to lie about it at this point. Here's yeah. where we are. Uh, last question. Um, could I get you to look ahead in the future a little bit? Uh, tell us something that you think that will impact your world 10, 20 years down the road that viewers of the show can look for and see if you got it right that we can think about. Listen, I think that the biggest uh, thing happened globally, and this is digital culture. Okay. Uh, we are not aware of that, as we are not aware from the moment we starting to use phones or cars or any of that technology. So uh, nobody is ready, in fact, to uh, to you know elaborate on on that historical switch. What uh, what did happen to us with switch on computers, on gadgets, on iPhones? Um, what happened with, uh, with us humans, first mm -hmm. of all? Uh, how did we change our perspective, our sight, uh, you know, our uh, speed, mm -hmm. uh, our fingers? Mm -hmm. Did they change? They did. Uh, our minds also, uh, our relationships with other people. It is not the same if you're writing me and I you long letters or just uh, little emoticons and little short uh, messages. And so on, and I, I'm, I'm talking banal things here, trivial things, but I think that exactly those trivial things are shaping- It really changes who we are. Our culture. Yeah. They shape not only literature, uh, because now everybody can write. Right. Everybody can self-publish. Everybody can go into fun fiction. Right. Everybody can change. It is full democracy. Dubrovko, Gracich, we are out of time. Thank you so much yeah, for being with you. us today. <laughs> thank you for being with us. Join us next time for more Current Conversation. Thank you for being with us. <laughs>